I've never really felt like I had any sort of experience with the paranormal or the afterlife until I met my husband. He has even told me that he has felt and seen things that are unexplainable. The first story is about my mother-in-law, who unfortunately passed away in 2018. That year, my soon-to-be husband and I were moving in together and talking about getting an apartment. But unfortunately, this was around the time when his mom was sick and needed to be in hospice. I told him that he should continue to live at home with her and enjoy the remaining time he had with her. His parents were both very welcoming, and I actually moved in too while all of this was going on. We lived in the basement apartment, and we could hear every step and every movement upstairs. A couple of months later, she passed away in bed with her family surrounding her. My father-in-law decided to cremate her and received her ashes on a Friday. But the funeral home told us that her spot would not be available until that Monday. There was no choice but to keep her urn upstairs until then. Growing up, my parents told us that although some people choose to keep their loved ones at home, we shouldn't do this. We believed that it was a way of not letting go and therefore their spirit would linger nearby. My husband's family actually thought the same and said it would be fine and Monday was only a couple of days away. That Saturday, I was the only one home. Everyone was gone and again, I could hear any noise upstairs. It was about midday and I was cleaning downstairs when I heard footsteps upstairs and I stopped. I knew those sounded exactly like my mother-in-law's steps. I wasn't scared, but it did catch me off guard. She was a beautiful person, and I felt like she was just walking around her home like those other Saturday mornings, cleaning and listening to music, one last time before leaving. Monday came, we had her service, and I never heard anything after that, but I'm sure it was her. The second experience was once we were moved out sometime later. We had been living in an apartment for over a year then. I didn't tell my husband this until we moved out because I knew you would feel uncomfortable. But I always felt something watching me in the living room area. I closed the patio blinds thinking maybe that contributed to it, but that wasn't it. Every time I sat down to watch TV in the living room or started to fall asleep on the couch, I felt like something was watching. It never felt menacing or malicious, but it was just an odd feeling. I would usually get up and go to our room, and I felt better. I wasn't the only one who felt this. Our little dog, Kristoff, definitely felt it too. He would never like to go down the hallway alone, and he especially didn't like the corner of the hallway turning to the restroom and the boiler room. He would always bark and refuse to go over there if a toy had rolled over there. It wasn't until the last month we were there that something happened. I'm always first to wake up and go to work, 5 a.m., walk down the hallway, get Kristoff's food, leave it for him, and I would go to the restroom. That morning, after turning around and making my way to the restroom, the door was slightly opened, and it slammed so hard by itself. I stopped a few feet away, and I couldn't believe it. There was no draft, and I walked forward and backward, thinking maybe I stepped a certain way to make the door move. I stared and worked up the courage to not give it more thought. I walked into the restroom and it was empty. Every morning after that, I did exactly the same way I did that morning, and it would not happen again. I would leave the restroom door slightly open every night, but every morning it would stay open. It never happened again, but I'm glad. In 2015, I moved in with my boyfriend to his mom's basement um, in Massachusetts. I don't know if you've ever been in a split house in Massachusetts, um, but it's like you come in the front door and you go up the stairs um, and then there's the first floor landing um, or you go down the stairs and then there's usually a basement. So to, if you go down the stairs, there's a basement door to the right. Um, if you open up that door immediately inside to the right was our bed. And then there was like a fireplace and a TV set up and a little sitting area. We lived there for about a year. And during that time, I had experienced some paranormal elements, I guess, that started out pretty subtle. So it started with this black cat that I would see 
and I had mentioned it to my boyfriend, Alex, and he said that his sister had also seen this black cat before. So I was like, oh, okay, so it's, you know, just something that is around, fine. Um, but then it started to evolve into something else. Where we slept on one side of the basement, and then there was a threshold to the kitchen on the other side of the basement. And at night, similarly to the cat's um, it's kind of like a third eye thing, I guess, but I could see three ghosts that would stand on the like edge of this threshold and it seemed like they couldn't pass that threshold. Um, so they were all dressed in like 1800s garb and one woman was in all white, one woman was in all black, and then there was a man that would wear a black suit and they would just stand there and watch us while we slept. So initially it was pretty jarring, um, but the more that they showed up and did nothing, the less I felt weird about it. If I had to get up to use the restroom in the middle of the night, there was a woman in an all-white dress that was just crying in the shower. She looked like she was wearing a wedding dress. Um, so that was uncomfortable. <laughs> I probably have bladder issues from trying to not use the bathroom in the middle of the night just to avoid her because she freaked me out. Um, but again, she, it was never anything where you're like, they were interacting with us. But then he started to work Uber and... He would get up at three o'clock in the morning to go pick people up and bring them to the airport because it was a really good time to be working. And I'm a very light sleeper. Um, so anytime that he would get up at 3 a.m., I would wake up and then I would fall back to sleep. And after a while of doing this, something started to shift where now there was this new weird entity that was there. And this one felt different than the rest. It felt very threatening. And it was this woman who would crawl on the floor towards me naked and wet and her hair was in her face. And I would get really bad at sleep paralysis. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I couldn't breathe. And for the first couple of times that it happened, she didn't reach me. I'd wake up before she reached me. But then after like the sixth time that it happened, she would end up reaching me. I felt terrified she was very small and very wet and like i said her hair was in front of her face i could never see her face and she moved so slowly that it was like i knew she was coming and my body would tense up and i wouldn't be able to move um because i knew that she was coming and she would slowly crawl up the bed and i would be able to feel like the different imprints in the bed as she came towards me um, until she reached me and she felt very evil, like she wanted something. And it would feel like something was sitting on top of my chest and sucking all of the air out of my mouth, like it was my soul or something. Which was very uncomfortable. And I couldn't wake up while it was happening. And I would be screaming without making any noise, like mentally screaming. And it's kind of like a Dementor in Harry Potter where it's like they suck the living soul out of you. And I could feel like a piece of me leaving my body. And then I would wake up and it would be a gasping wake up. I'd never experienced that before um, where I couldn't breathe. And it got to the point where this was happening so frequently and she kept coming back that I started to lucid dream. Um, so I would wake up in my dream and I knew that she was going to be coming. Um, so I knew I'd have to wake myself up. And then when I did, I'd wake up in another dream, but I was always in the same room. Nothing was different. Um, sometimes Alex would be there in my dream and I would like, I'd be like, Alex, you need to wake me up. It's like, it's back. I need you to find me in the real world and wake me up. But it was like something that I kept to myself. And then eventually he mentioned to me that he felt something similar, that something was sucking out his soul and he had really bad sleep paralysis. He doesn't like to talk about this stuff at all. Like he doesn't like to talk about paranormal stuff. He doesn't, he likes to pretend it does not exist. Um, it is not part of his world. I don't know what she was or what, what she wanted or anything like that. It just felt very predatory and like, angry eventually we moved out of there and i've not experienced anything like that since so yeah i don't know what it was but after all was said and done he told me that when he was a kid 
um, his mom and sister and he used to do seances in the basement. And his sister had also seen, I think, one of the women in 1800s garb. And then the last time I was there was Christmas of, it was probably last year, 2022. And we stayed at his mom's house and we were sleeping and he needs to sleep with the lights on probably because he had experienced stuff like this. I woke up in the middle of the night and there was something that was coming out of the wall that looked like a person draped in like sandpaper. And the second that they saw me, they like started to come out and then they saw me and they just went right back in. It was a very slow thing. And I was just like, I'm not, not I'm just going to go back to bed and pretend this never happened. I don't think I realized how close to the paranormal world I could get. It made me realize that any time that I do tap into anything like that, like there's stuff out there that I don't want to know about. And I would rather keep that door closed um, entirely. While living in a room of the house with two other roommates, a friend spent the night over on a weekend eve. I gave her my bed. I was sleeping on a low floor level trommel bed placed perpendicularly next to her bed. So my feet were facing her side. In the middle of the night, I was startled out of a deep sleep by her yelling. I sat up in my dark room. Then I shockingly saw an extremely black flitting shadow fighting with my friend. She was fighting and punching it. Then it was flitting in quick jabs toward and away from her. I was paralyzed witnessing it in a state of shock and terror. I was able to yell at it, hey, get away from her. It stopped, looked at me, then attacked me. I have never felt bone chilling cold like that as it brushed over me. It was hovering atop of my head, but then I was covering my head with my arms and had my eyes closed as I felt this angry, cold presence start trying to saturate into me from the top of my head downward. I was desperate to get it off of me. I faintly heard my friend yelling, no, get off of her. In a flash of an idea, my atheist self immediately said a prayer. And I saw in my mind's eye a picture of a kind being with his hand outstretched out in front of him, as if to protect me or ward it off. And it worked. The evil being slowly removed itself. I lifted my head, opened my eyes, just in time to see it fly up into the ceiling, and the room warmed back up again. I immediately went to my friend's side to console her, and she told me what she had experienced and seen before I told her my own view and experience. Previous to this, I had been a devout Catholic convert, but a staunch atheist. But I am still not religious. Yet I went from staunch atheist to being agnostic. And by the way, my other roommate also heard us that night. Thirty years ago, I worked in the operating theater complex of a large London General Hospital, the now demolished Greenwich District Hospital. It wasn't an old hospital, and there were no stories about ghosts as far as I knew, but one place was different. The operating complex was big and busy, six theaters, most of which had morning and afternoon lists. Theaters one and two were for general surgery. Three was for gynecological operations, four was for eyes, and five and six were orthopedic theaters. There were up to 60 operations per day. Anyone who worked there for long enough had a story about something strange happening, mostly things moving in the ways they shouldn't. These things usually happened at night or at other quiet times. Although there was a funny thing that happened during the day one time. In a busy theater between ops, the medical staff were preparing for the next patient, and the cleaning staff were doing their thing. Suddenly, a young student in her screamed. All heads turned toward her, then looked in the direction she was staring. The cotton strip 
that tied a cleaner's dress at the back of the bow was being slowly pulled. The cleaner thought it was something lurking around until the scream. About eight people saw that. These kinds of things happened, or perhaps, should I say, were noticed about once a year. I was part of the ancillary staff, and my job was to supply the theaters with the instruments from the large storeroom, sterilize the instruments, and to help out in the theaters when required. The shifts were 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., 2 p.m. to 10 p.m., and the night shift, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., which I had to do one week in seven. I'd been working there about three years. On one night, I was working around the back in the store area. At the back of each theater were two sets of four doors. Sterile instruments were put into the cupboards with the four doors, and dirty material was collected from the other cupboards. All the doors were closed. I went around the front of the theaters for a couple of minutes, and when I returned, every door was wide open. Forty-eight doors, all open to their fullest. I went straight back and asked the nurses if they'd been in the store, which I knew they hadn't. There was no explanation, but that's not my main story. I didn't witness those doors being opened, so that doesn't count. I was on nights one week, starting at 2,200 hours, and I was having a game of pool and a beer in the hospital club before work. Just one week beer, mind. The phone behind the bar rang, and it was from me. My colleague on the 2 to 10 shift warned me that the place was like a mash unit. Cold surgery had run on and on, and there were several emergency operations coming in. He'd been so busy that he was unable to clear the backlog of instruments to be sterilized. So I was in for a very busy night. I agreed to go in early, and I left the club at 0930. I was, indeed, extremely busy when I got there. It took me a few hours to sterilize the backlog, and all the time, dashing back and forth into the theaters to help lift and position patients, and keeping the surgical team supplied with what they needed. By about 0100, things quieted down. But I still needed to fill the hatches with the instruments for the next day's surgery. Six theaters with full lists. The main store was about 20 yards long and six wide. Along three walls, there were shelves floor to ceiling full of instruments, either on metal trays and double wrapped linen, or in smaller packs of instruments for particular operations. For example, for a hysterectomy, you'd need a general set tube plus a hysterectomy set, plus drains, sutures, swabs, and all the rest of it. Each surgeon had their particular favorite devices like forceps or scalpel handles of various types. It was about 1.30, and I was steadily working on my way through the lists. I heard a thump, like something had bumped into the wall. I looked up. Suddenly, a pack of instruments came off a high shelf and landed on the floor two yards from me. The higher shelves were recessed and not as deep as the lower ones, containing the biggest general sets. So if anything had toppled off a higher shelf, it would have simply landed on a lower, deeper shelf. In any case, the pack, a gallbladder pack weighing about three or four kilos, hadn't toppled off, it had flown off, and I had seen it with my own eyes. I heard myself say, do that again. Funny now. I didn't feel afraid at all. This was my place. I'd been there for years, busy though I was. I sat down and had a word with myself. I told myself to fix this incident in my memory, as memory fades with time. I also put the pack back on the shelf and tried to coax it off, but as I said before, it just couldn't 
have happened that way. I didn't tell anyone about what happened for many years. Being young, I was afraid of what people might say. And I didn't want to be ridiculed. I didn't even tell the theater staff. And I'm not sure why. Now I have much more life behind me than in front of me. And I don't care what anyone thinks. It's not the ambit of the horror. Quite mundane, in fact. But it happened. Heavy packs of stainless steel instruments should not, according to the laws of physics, fly off shelves. A Warrenville Schoolhouse Ghost Warrenville, Illinois, 1912. The story began in 1911 and involved, for the most part, two people. Miss Edith Smith, single, school teacher, and Sylvester E. Adams, married, manager. At that time, Sylvester E. Adams, about 49 years old, had been married for nine years. Sylvester and his wife, Jenny, were living at 717 South Winchester in Chicago, Illinois. That residence is no longer there. It appears it is now a major hospital. Fittingly enough, Sylvester Adams had moved from Jamestown, North Dakota to Chicago, and after moving there, he met and married Jenny, who was about 10 years older than he was. A couple years after their marriage, he began working for the Express Company as a manager. By 1911, he'd been employed there for seven years. Miss Edith Smith was a school teacher. She was about 32 years old at the time of this story. She lived not far from her schoolhouse in the city of Wheaton, Illinois. It was a small schoolhouse that stood in the middle of a desolate prairie about 10 minutes from the city of Wheaton and about a mile and a half from the village of Warrenville. The schoolhouse was called the Matthews Corporation School, and she'd been teaching there for six years by 1911. Miss Smith was popular in the city of Wheaton where she lived, and she was active in a society group. Her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Smith, lived in Winlap, Washington. She had a brother and sister living in Chicago. Friday, January 11, 1912. It was a cold, snowy day. The desolate schoolhouse roof was covered with snow when the children made it to school that day, probably by foot, horse, or buggy, as automobiles were only available to the well-to-do at that time. Some children walked as far as five miles to school, and also in that day, some would even attend elementary school at night because they were working during the day. On that cold Friday in January 1912, Sylvester Adams bought a round-trip electric railroad ticket. He boarded a train for Wheaton at the Fifth Avenue station in Chicago where he lived. At the Matthews Corporate Schoolhouse around 2.30 p.m., the children and the teacher heard a noise at the door. It was the sound of someone shaking the snow off their shoes. That sound was followed by the door to the school opening. And a stranger then walked into the room. The children didn't know him, but it was Sylvester Adams. They said he had a somber and threatening look on his face, and they were frightened by his appearance. After entering the room, he firmly nodded toward Miss Etta Smith. The children said their teacher looked disturbed by his visit and did not return any greeting. Adams then took a seat on a bench at the rear of the schoolroom. We'll leave the schoolhouse scene for a moment, with Miss Smith standing in the front of her class and Mr. Adams sitting on a bench in the rear of the classroom for a short step back in time. As I mentioned earlier, Sylvester Adams was a married man. His wife was Jenny. She was a friend of the teacher, Miss Smith. When the two women began hanging out, Mr. Adams soon took a liking to the younger school teacher and began making attempts to meet up with her in private. In fact, a few of the school children said that there were a couple of occasions when Mr. Adams visited the schoolhouse while Edith was working. Edith refused Sylvester's attempts at having an affair, and eventually it got to the point that Edith decided she needed to put an end to his advancements. On December 26, 1911, she wrote him a letter. Mr. Adams, I always thought that you were a gentleman but I am almost persuaded that you are not. I cannot and will not meet any married man in a place without his wife's consent. 
and Mrs. Adams being a friend of mine, makes it even more sure. Take my word for it. I have respected your honor more than you have mine. If you wish my respect, then you must stop pestering me. I have not told anyone about them, and it will be yourself that will be the first to blacken your reputation. No talk with me will help either of us, so please let me think as well of you as I can. I can overlook the part, but I may not in the future. You must be a man for your wife's sake. May God and the angel friends help you. Respectfully, Edith Smith. A note was written in return by Sylvester Adams, but the letter was not sent to her. It simply said, If you do not need me, God help you. You'll regret it. Sylvester Adams. Back to the schoolhouse scene, which was two weeks after she wrote the letter. While Adams was seated at the bench in the rear of the schoolhouse, Miss Smith tried to continue with her teaching, but the children noted in so many words that she seemed to be suppressing some anxiety for the rest of the session. Adams, on the other hand, remained perfectly quiet in the back for about five minutes. Then he slid over on the bench toward the schoolhouse door, and he pushed the bolt to lock the door. But a small brave girl got up from her seat, walked over to the door, slid the bolt back open, and sat back down. Mr. Adams did not attempt to lock the door again after that. After an hour and a half, four o'clock came around and school was done for the weekend. Miss Snip dismissed the children. As they were walking out, many of the children were looking back at the stranger sitting on the bench, curious to ask what was going on. Once outside, some of the kids, especially the little girls, sprinted off home. But at least two of the children, one being 14-year-old Willie Kronig, lingered behind. He watched inside as the stranger got up from the bench and approached his teacher, and as she was walking to the exit, he grabbed her hand and began saying something to her. When the 14-year-old Willie saw the two struggling, he got scared and ran as fast as he could for help. He went to nearby Otto Seehauser's farmhouse. Otto was an elderly gentleman, about 83, who had fought in the Union 7th Infantry in the Civil War. But as Willie began to plead for Seahauser's help, the two heard muffled bangs come from the schoolhouse. And upon looking over at the schoolhouse, they saw curls of smoke coming out of the schoolhouse door. Willie and Otto ran as quickly as they could to the schoolhouse, but they couldn't hear a sound from inside the school. So slowly they peered inside and saw Miss Smith lying stretched out on the floor in front of her desk. She had been shot in the right temple. Sylvester Adams was lying nearby on his back, open eyes staring at the ceiling, a pistol lying nearby. Both were dead. There was evidence of a struggle with desks turned over, ink spilled on her desk, ribbons from the teacher's hair scattered about, and papers lying all around the floor. After investigating, officials found the letter Miss Smith had written to Mr. Adams, as well as an undelivered note he'd written to her. It was crumpled up in a ball. But they also found a check for $500 in Adams' possession that suggested Adams was planning to elope with Edith Smith, but she refused. After the event, Sylvester Adams' wife, Jenny, had nothing to say about her dead husband only that she had no idea he had feelings for her good friend, Edith Smith. She added that she only grieved for a good friend, whom her husband had killed, saying, Edith laid down her life to save our honor. She added that just a few days before the murder, in a letter dated January 8, 1912, Edith Smith had sent a letter to Mrs. Adams. They wrote often. Along with the letter, Edith sent a handkerchief as a gift, and she said that, she thought Jenny as the first of all her friends. But unlike all the previous letters that Edith had written to her, she made no mention of good wishes to Sylvester. No mention of him at all. Jenny Adams said, This little martyr laid down her life to save my husband's honor and to save our honor. The Ghost of Edith Smith Several days after the murder-suicide at the schoolhouse, Children were again arriving for school with a new teacher at the elm. One morning, one of the children was heading toward the schoolhouse 
And as he looked up, he saw his dead teacher, Miss Edith Smith, staring out the window of the old schoolhouse. The child ran home screaming to his mother's arms. Other reports of Edith Smith's ghost began to surface from the students, and by late January, only a couple of weeks after the murder, the new teacher protested against holding class in the old schoolhouse any longer. The county decided they would demolish the old schoolhouse where the murder took place and build a new schoolhouse in its place. In the meantime, the children were transported to another school in the nearby city of Aurora. It was a longer walk, but the students were unanimous and that they would not mind the further distance. The expected date of the new school was Labor Day, 1913. I'm not sure what sits on the property of the old schoolhouse today, where Sylvester Adams selfishly took the life of a beloved teacher and friend to many, Edith Smith. But I wonder if the ghost of Edith Smith, that some of her students had seen, is still peering out windows from what she believes to be the old Matthews corporate schoolhouse that sits on a desolate prairie road in Warrenville, Illinois, waiting for her pupils to arrive for another day at school.